and on the way. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's about improving the life, well-being, and productivity of technicians everywhere, regardless of industry. Um, I am your host, Joshua Taylor, founder of Wrench Turners Online and the sweaty leader. Um, some of you may already know what that is and we'll be releasing that a little bit more at a later date. But today... We are finalizing our recruiter series with a gentleman who was a Lexus technician, shop foreman, and now is a recruiter for Peterbilt, none other than Josh Goodwin. Josh, thank you very much for coming to the show today. Thank you for having me, Josh. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Awesome. Awesome. It's all about the technicians, right? We're doing everything we possibly can to help them out, get them into places where they feel like they fit, they can survive more so than than just being we want them to to thrive where they're at so that they feel like they fit they can make a, a good living for themselves and for their families that's right that is uh that's why i transitioned into being a uh, being a recruiter awesome awesome so let's let's we've already been doing this for a little bit and i'm gonna have to get super creative with production because the, the conversation's awesome i'm gonna try and include it somehow but uh, let's go back to the beginning as it were because you started out turning wrenches mm -hmm. so i'd like to hear what got you into the trade in the first place? All right. Fantastic. So, so quick story here, um, how I became a mechanic. So I was, uh, I was in high school. My, my dad's job relocated us to Georgia. So I'm originally from Texas and, uh, I was dead set that I was moving back to Texas. And, uh, as soon as I graduated, so I had a, uh, a, a 94 F-150 that I drove around while I was in high school. And, uh, it was a great truck, ready to take off and head back to Texas the day after graduation. And so uh, I was going through my senior year in high school, and uh, my dad had said, "Hey, if you're if you're going to take that truck back to Texas, you need to put some tires on it because the tires are a little bald. You need to change the oil in it. You know, just check the brakes. You know, kind of get it. You know, get it trip worthy, uh, worthy, right? Okay, fantastic. So I was actually driving out here in Georgia, and uh, I passed a shop, a little mom and pop shop. It's called Foster Tire. And uh, they had a help wanted sign up there and I drove right past it and I got about a mile down the road. And I was like, man, I was like, if I went to work there, I bet I'd get a discount on tires. I said, I bet you I could change my own oil and uh, I bet you I could get my truck ready to go. So I flipped a U-turn. I went back to that shop. I went in there and I applied, sat down with the owner right there, talked with him. And uh, the next day when I when I got out of high school uh, or got finished my day in school, he told me to come on by and go to work. Right. and I never left right I, I started working there uh started working there learning you know just the basics old changing uh learning how to i did some tires you know brakes just just minor stuff um and uh ended up graduating high school did not leave you know made friends decided mm -hmm. uh, you know i'm gonna stay here i actually met my wife uh uh and so Went from that that store to uh, down the road. There was a Goodyear, and I, you know, I was told that Goodyear was better, you know, better company to work for, stuff like that. So I ended up going to a Goodyear, uh, where I actually met uh, probably my first mentor in the industry. Uh, so he was he was a manager there. Um, I was young. I don't know what he saw in me, uh, but I know I know the first thing he told me to do was take out the trash. And so I made it a point in my job to keep that shop free of trash, right? I mean, I, at one point I was carrying a trash can around in my hand, just emptying other ones into it, taking it out to the dumpster, right? So uh, that lasted for about four years. Well, he moved on. He uh, he actually went to the Lexus dealership. And uh, about a month later, he called me. He said, hey, he said, uh, you need to, uh, he's like, you need to get into the dealership world. And uh, so he, we talked, right. And uh, I was like, okay, you know, and he was my mentor. I mean, he taught me a lot. So I listened, I valued what he said. You know what I mean? When he, when he mm -hmm. said, this is good for you, I really trusted that it. it was good for me. I was young. I didn't know the industry all that well, even though I'd been in at Goodyear for about four years at that point, I didn't know it that well. So I, uh, so I went down and I interviewed and the service manager, I mean, he basically offered me the job before I left. Um, I was just going to be changing all starting like everybody else starts right you know at the bottom change oil do tires and uh so i went i went and started at the at the lexus dealership and that was that was probably the beginning of the rest of my career um you know that that is what took me to where i am today uh learning the dealership learning 
how it operates, not just not just fixing cars, but really kind of taking time to understand what productivity is, how to be pro- productive, how to be proficient with my time, learning to manage my day, right? Um, and so I really took a took a learning to it, and I really at that point is when I really started kind of developing a career path for myself uh, that I'm still on today. Like it hasn't changed. I'm still in. I am actually still on the path that I set forth back when I was 22 years old. Mm-hmm. What's really cool here, and and not to downplay anything, but it's it's interesting that you started to be a mechanic because you wanted a discount on tires. I don't think I have ever heard anyone ever say, how can I get a discount? And their their counter offer is, why don't I work for you? <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's I wish, a first. I, think I, wish, that's a- I wish I could tell you I was making it up, but I'm not. I mean, that is, honestly, that is where I went. Uh, it was, And it was just a tire shop. I mean, literally, Foster Tire. I mean, they did brakes and tires, you know, shocks. Like, there was nothing else there. And that's why I went there. And uh, uh, funny thing is, just to conclude that story, I never bought tires from them. <laughs> so all of that, all of that, I never even got tires from them. Yeah, never even got oh, tires from them. That's um, awesome. So, yeah, so, so having these conversations, you know, when, when, when I've had my, my bosses, you know, they're like, um, what's a career path for a technician? I, I kind of pause and I'm like, I mean... You're going to have to be more specific in your in your question. What What is a career path for a technician? I was like, it can be anything. I was like, show me the technician and let's talk about the career path. I was like, traditionally in the past, right, we've all kind of had the mindset of, hey, I'm going to be a shop. I'm going to work in the shop. I'm going to be a loop tech. I'm going to be on the line. I'm going to be fixing cars. I'm going to be a foreman. Um, I'm going to go be a service advisor, maybe a service manager, just depending on the size of the shop, right? I was like, that was always the traditional route for a technician. I said, but I think you guys look at it wrong. I was like, technicians are by far the most qualified individuals in a dealership. They know the vehicle, they know the product, and they know it better than just about anybody else there. So here's what I I challenge my my boss with is I was like, learn the person. If they can talk, if they have a gift of gaff, maybe sales is where they should be at because they're going to sell that vehicle better than anybody else out there. Because they answer questions honestly, truthfully, and on point. So the, the customer knows when you're lying to them. They ain't going to have that problem, right? Maybe they're a little quieter. Maybe they don't necessarily like the interaction of people so much. Parts is where they would be at, right? Looking up parts. Name a part. A good technician will tell you where it's located. No problem finding it. They can go straight to the straight to the schematic. They can pull the part up, tell you the price quicker than most of the parts guys that I know on the counter now, right? I said, and then you have the guys who are really good at leading the shop, right? Uh, They're really natural born leaders. They have that gift inside of them to lead by example. Those are your guys that maybe you do start moving up into the foreman role. Those are the guys who want to mentor. Those are the guys who want to teach. So many times I've seen people pushed into the foreman role that don't want to interact with anybody. So you've got a foreman that's not a mentor. You're going to have a bad shop, right? You're just not going to have learning. You're not going to have growing. You're not going to have any of that. So you have and it to gets worse, too, because if, if the foreman isn't capable of teaching, that's problem one. Problem two is if the foreman also doesn't have autonomy and authority to do what they need to do to teach and learn. Because one of the things that I see that's lost, you know, I, my 10-year-old at school, the, the teachers don't have the autonomy and authority to discipline and enforce. Mm-hmm. That is part of the problem with that I part of the problem, not the only problem, but part of the mm-hmm. problem that we see as a whole for the younger generation. They mm-hmm. haven't had the discipline given that they needed to be given the enforcement of rules, regulations, policies, procedures to know that this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, this is the this is the line the same where you need to ask. They haven't been given that clear cut understanding. The same thing applies in the shop. If a shop foreman or shop leader of any kind doesn't have the authority and autonomy to be able to make decisions, to be able to lead properly, enforce both the positive and the negative, they're of no value as a leader. They're of no value as a leader. Now you're just really, you're, you're paying extra for something you're not getting. 
And it's yeah. your fault that you're not getting it because you're not yeah. supplying the autonomy, the autonomy well, and authority. Well, and, and it goes a step further than that, even Josh. They're not only they're not only doing that, but they're also setting that guy up for failure, right? Mm-hmm. They're taking that guy, they're putting him in him, they're putting him in a position that he's not going to be successful in. So now, you, now at some point in his career, you're going to have to have that conversation with this just isn't working out. Right. And we all don't we all hate that conversation. We don't want to have that conversation. This just isn't this. This just isn't working out. This isn't the place for you. Right. And that's a tough conversation. But that conversation was had because you took a technician who was good on the floor and you put him in an environment that he wasn't going to be successful. in. So what I challenge, I challenge my, my boss within in our conversation is that instead of trying to can write out a career path for a technician, maybe we change the value to. What do we do with the greatest asset at the dealership, the technician, the greatest asset we have? Let's look at them on an individual level and let's say here's a multitude of opportunities for you and you can do any of them. Why does it have to be one or the other? Why does it have to be cut or dry? If he likes to talk, if he's great interacting with people, sales might be where he wants to be, whether it's a service advisor, truck sales, you know, outside parts sales, whatever the case is, selling is where he wants to be, right? That's he he can talk. He's good at it. He knows the product. The more quiet guy, because they're in every shop, the dude who just likes to keep to himself, does a heck of a lot of work, but he just ain't talking to him. Maybe he's more in the parts sector, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he just wants to stay a technician too, you know. And but really what you're talking about parts. is personalization at scale, right? That's the one-on-one, that's, that's the one-on-one coaching. And then they, you don't even have to put the label of coaching to it. It's just one-on-one conversations between a leader and their team, right? Yeah. Individualized and personal. And that's why I keep using personalization at scale because you have a service manager or, or a general manager, you've got anywhere from two to 200 people that you're leading. Every one right. of those people are people. They're individual human beings. Yes, they're part of a bigger team, but they're individual human beings. In order for them to be successful, they need to be doing the thing that makes them successful. And them doing the thing that makes them successful might not necessarily be the thing that you want them to do. Maybe they need to go a different path. But all of that requires a conversation, regular mm-hmm. conversation, not one conversation a year as a quote unquote performance review a regular conversation about what's going on. Are your personal goals being met? Are your professional goals being met? Do you want to try doing something else? Do you want to learn about something else? Hey, do you want to go fishing? Hey, whatever the case, we just having those personal conversations, right? Those are, those are the most impactful things for our business. So um, why don't we take a quick pause and try and start this thing? So you've got, Usually I ask about what the first year is like, but it sounds like I know exactly what the first year was like. It was changing a, a truck ton of tires, a truck ton of brakes, a truck ton of a struts, and that's about it. It wasn't really any diagnosis involved. It was somebody telling you that needs tires, that needs brakes, that needs struts, and you did it. And you did it for probably about a solid four years of doing exactly the same things. Thanks. So you weren't really learning a whole lot, but you were you were learning – a lot of things. The things that you weren't learning are the things that we don't typically quantify. You were learning work ethic. You were learning mm-hmm. hard work. You were learning um, basic safety, basic inspections, learning mm-hmm. how to do a walk around without ever really knowing that it was a walk around because that's what mentors do. That's, they teach you without exactly, teaching, right? That's exactly right. What I learned was process. What I learned was if I if I did the same thing on every vehicle, it all turned out good in the end, right? I didn't mm-hmm. make the mistakes. I didn't forget drain plugs were loose. I didn't. I didn't forget lug nuts were loose. Right. I uh, because I developed a process. That is what I learned in my first year, and that process goes with you to bigger repairs, larger repairs. It goes on with your diagnostics. It's it's it goes with you through your entire career. But that would be the probably the biggest thing I learned through my time. You know, kind of in the independent world before I made it to the dealership was to develop a process follow that process every day on every vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's mirrored, you know, when, when our, our shared, our shared mutual friend Marshall um, would tell you the same thing. Uh, We've had this conversation in in our our 10 mil group chat all the time talking about process. And I've said it time and time again, that it's the boring things that make us the most money as mechanics and learning to, to when you create a process for yourself, 
when you realize what I do, you know, the, the driver's side rear tire first and the driver's side front tire and the passenger side front tire and the passenger side rear tire. And it doesn't matter what with what you are doing and you do that order, that becomes the basis of all of your processes. It doesn't yes. matter what it is you're doing, what you're diagnosing, what you're repairing, but that basic process moves with you, like you said. And the mm -hmm. cool thing is as you progress in the trade, that process then becomes larger and larger and larger depending on what you're doing or it slightly veers off that course depending on the system you're working on or, or the reason you're working on it or whatever. But as you do those processes a thousand times, that part of the process becomes boring because you no longer have to think, right? That it's the boring things that you no longer have to think about. As long as you're still following the process, mm -hmm. step, 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 step. That's the important part because we can, can become complacent, right? The last thing we mm -hmm. want to do is become complacent and skip steps in our process. And it's when mm -hmm. we – and who was it? Who was it? I think it was Sean Butler uh, that said that that really – chime the bell for me on this one is what process did you skip for you to for you to land in my office as a service manager i am your boss i am your leader you're now sitting in the little boy's chair in my office what process did you skip in order to land you in my office so it's the boring processes if we skip yes. them that's where we end up we end up in the little boy's or girl's chair so 100%. awesome and, it, and it's foundational across our, our our career and it doesn't really matter what we then lead into because as we were discussing before before the intro which i gotta try and figure out how to get into is is that we can do lots of things outside of um lots of things outside of just being mechanic like we can specialize we can become more than just a general tech we can go into transmissions electrical diagnostics diesel heavy duty diesel like in in the light duty world you know there's chevy and ford both have like F450s, F550s, it's kind of broaching on the heavy truck kind of area things. Mm -hmm. You've got cab chassis, which then you get into things like it. So there are some stores that, you know, they have built in facilities where they deal with refrigeration units and yes. things of that nature that can then become an add on into the dealership world. You know, all of that stuff, it's all building on what we do. And mm -hmm. the cool thing is functionally is as mechanics, we're really good problem solvers because we look at processes every day. Process, process, A, B, 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 C, 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 D, D, and we follow those steps over and over again. And what we're trying to do is find the, all of a sudden it skipped C and went to F. It's like, wait a second, where's D and E? Yeah, we know that something's that. wrong because we, we know that those six processes are supposed to exist in that order. And all of a sudden there's mm -hmm. something missing. Oh, light bulb goes on. That awareness is part of our innate intelligence as a mechanic as we build the processes. So that's, that's kind of cool that that happens over time. Well, the other thing that you said in there is about mentors. Yes. That, that I just want to very quickly highlight that everybody that's been on the show that still loves the industry, even if they're not turning wrenches anymore, mentorship is so important on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. It's so incredibly important on the shop floor for autonomy, authority, mentorship, training, coaching, personal relationships, team building, all of the above, that that mentor role on the shop floor, whether it's in the field, uh, on a big or a small shop floor, is vitally important for sustainable technicians. With with that, just note, you know, I was very careful with my words because that was my first mentor. Mm -hmm. It was not necessarily my last mentor. Um, mm -hmm. Throughout my career, um, even even to this day right now, I have mentors that have that helped me they walk me through they guide me through you know uh, uh different situations i mean just just yesterday i was typing up an email and i wanted to make sure that it was um i wanted to make sure the wording was professional right so i'm not necessarily working i'm not wrench turning right but there's still importance in in some of the stuff that i you know that we that we send out and i wanted to make sure that the wording was professional I sent the email to my my mentor first, the guy that I the guy that I work with right now. I'm like, hey, can you proofread this and red uh, redline this thing for me? Um, I feel like I, I left some words out that probably need to be in here that'll just make this a little bit little bit easier to read. And uh, and he sent it back, redline. Hey, these are this is what I would add. This is what I would take out. This is how I would say that. You know, um, because we're all human. Um, sometimes we get, you know, sometimes we don't have the words. Sometimes we're too attached to something and we need a, a different perspective from somebody to help us break that attachment. Right. Um, 
but I did. He was my first mentor, but he was far from being my last one. Awesome. I think we need to always, always have somebody teaching us something. And that's kind of where mentorship comes. I think McConaughey said it best. And I've always got somebody to chase. Um, those, those moments, and it, you don't necessarily need to have one. You can have lots. They don't necessarily need to be, need to know that they're actually the mentor. It's just somebody that, you know, somebody's doing something that you want to bring into your life, whether it's personally or professionally. Um, it, I think there's a, a line in the sand that I think we need to teach, especially young men, is that it mm -hmm. can be, and I've had this discussion a couple of times in coaching, it can become an obsession. And it's like, I want to be just like them. It's like, no, you need to be just like you and take right. on some of their traits and become you. Because um, that it's that, and I bring a personal story in this. My son literally said it this morning. It's like, I want to, I, why, I asked him, why did you do that? Because I wanted to make you happy. It's like that 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 hurt me a little bit. Like, no, 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 no. You need to be doing things to make you happy, make sure. you successful. And that's one of the tactics that I use both for him and in coaching. And it, it's you. You need to do this so you can be successful, successful with your processes in your day. This isn't about me. This is entirely about you. You are doing the things to make you happy. You are making doing things to make you successful. Um, I am yeah. helping you. I'm helping guide you to make better choices for yeah. you. It's not to do with what I want. It's with me teaching you. Well, and and, and even hard. even even a step further on that, Josh is, I'm, I'm your accountability partner, right? So, it the goal is yours. My job is to guide you in that direction and hold you accountable to reaching that goal, right? It's accountability as well, um, wh whether it's your son, your daughter, whether it's a coworker, you know, somebody that you're teaching, a, a, you know, uh, a, a young entry-level technician, right? Um, accountability is part of that mentorship as well, but it is your goal, right? It is mm -hmm. your, your desire to, to, to complete this. It's your career. I'm mm -hmm. just going to help guide and direct you. You've got to drive the car, right? So, and it's super hard to do that because, especially, you know, young people, young men. You know, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to like I've had the opportunity on the podcast to couple to talk to a couple of women in the industry and a couple of female technicians. And the cool thing is their their experience in the industry is quite similar. It's slightly different, obviously, for a lot of reasons. And, and in some mm -hmm. circumstances, it's dramatically different for yeah. a lot of reasons. But at the same time, we still have, like we were talking about before, a lot of shared experiences, regardless of, of, of what right side of the street you, you drive down. So right. the, the interesting thing there is the young people are are sponges. They're really sponges with what we do, what we say, how we say it, where we where we go, what we do, and, and all of those things. And we have to be mindful of that is the the do as I say, not as I do is really hurtful to a lot of people. And I said it in a meeting today where where you know you can say a lot of things, but if you're not representing the role that you're placing, right? Doesn't matter whether it's the business you're working in, whether it's a person you're working for, whether you're a contractor consultant, if you say one thing and do another, that's not really great for the team, that's right. right? If you're in a position of authority and autonomy, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're not representing the role, but you're talking like you are, they're looking at what you're doing, not what you're saying. And as, and as we know, 80% of, of, of language comes from your body, not, not from anything. what you say. And even still, it's something like 7% of the words you use. You know, there's, it's like 10% of the, the 10% of language is the tonality and the yeah. emphasis more than the words themselves. So more than the even, words themselves. That's 100 percent right? right. I was, I was about to say the exact same thing. It's people watch more of what you do and how you, how you react to something versus what you're saying. Uh, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. with my kids so I, I have a 13 year old and and an 11 year old um i tell them all the time i'm like i don't care what you tell me it's the result that matters to me like if you if you tell me that that you that if you if you tell me that you've been doing 100 push-ups every day that's fantastic when i sit down to watch you and you can only do five i'm going to tell you you've been lying to me 
Mm-hmm. No, I, I'm doing. You're not doing them because if you were doing them, you you would do more than five. You know what I mean? It's the results. It's the body language. It's that's what that's what matters. But going back to um, you know, kind of kind of what we we're talking about with the younger generation right there. You know, when we social media has created something where you get to see the lives of a lot of people. So, you know, when I was younger, um, we didn't have social media and, and all that stuff, right? All you knew about actors or athletes or what is what you saw, right? You just mm-hmm. saw them on the screen. Like, man, that's really cool. You know, you watch a movie and you think the actor was awesome because he was acting, right? You didn't. Now we see behind the scenes. We you get to see these people's personal lives. They share so much with you or at least what they want you to see, right? Again, they're still acting, but as a young person, you're like, no, that's who they are. That's how they are. I want to be just like them. I want to do, and they start trying to mold a life of somebody else instead of, instead of, like you said, taking traits. And like, mm-hmm. I like that trait. I'm going to, I'm going to be me, but I am going to take this trait from somebody, right? Or I'm going to take this, you know, take this, you know, learning lesson from somebody else and I'm mm-hmm. going to apply it to my life, but I'm still me, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's one of, you know, that's sometimes we run into issues with that, with the younger generation of not, not being able to differentiate between who you are and who they are. It's not the same thing. It's not the same person. No, and it, it's hard for them because they don't, a lot of, especially I'm finding like my son is, is very susceptible. Yours as at 11 mm-hmm. is as well. They don't understand the difference between you know, what, what media is and what real life is yet yeah. they're, they're starting to learn and we're having to, to really coach them and get them through it and guide them. As you said, it, like it's, it, that guide is really important and it's a challenge because they get bombarded by it. Even, even the, like we, we measure to a, not to the nth degree, but we measure fairly highly what, what my son sees and does uh, mm-hmm. in terms of how much screen time he gets. Um, we yes. really try to make sure like I, I'm not nearly as good as it uh, uh, as lately as I should be, but I used to read to him every day. Um, I'm trying to get back into that because one of the things that it really does it it's a shared experience. We talk about shared experiences, father to son especially. Mm-hmm. He needs to be reading. He needs to be understanding how much more impactful to his life that reading is is than than the screen time. Now at the same time, you know there are things like what is socially acceptable, things that. I may take for granted that we go back, you know, 20 years, 30, 30 years of us growing up with television, the way we grew up with it. Like there are cultural things that you and I will share, even though we are from incredibly different places, things that we can willing to bet. We both can, can quote the Simpsons at the same time. It's just something that is culturally relevant. Whereas in order for him to have a lot of the same culture experiences as some of his peers who seem to already at 10 live with a phone in their hand and live on Facebook or Twitter or whatever the case may be, some of that stuff they really shouldn't be seeing in my in my opinion, right? There, it's there's a, a level of of protective nature that I want him to be prepared for when he sees it for the first time. And seeing it at ten is not appropriate. He need there's a whole series of things he needs to learn first to be able to gauge yes. reality and and be able to cope. He is 100%. he is obviously. Because he's a September baby, he is easily nine months behind in maturity than majority of his class. Because apparently a lot of his class is like January, February, March babies. That six months at 10 is a big deal, right? And Mm -hmm. he's an only child. So most of his class have siblings. So there's also Mm -hmm. a level of maturity that he's not getting because he doesn't have a sibling. So there's, there's things that I have to take into account that, that, my wife and I really have to talk a lot about it's like, okay, are we going to do this? Are we not going to do this? Are we going to give him this? Are we not going to give him this? And like, we have, we have to have those conversations. The cool thing is we're having them. Right. That is, that is the good thing. I call that, you know, that's what my wife and I, you know, we've had a lot of the same conversations. It sounds like, and you know, what I, how I refer to it is preserving innocence. So part of, part of my job, I feel as a, as a dad is, you know, protect your family. Right. Um, like provide for protect your family you know all you right that's just that's that's how i view my my role right part of that in my opinion there is 
preserving the innocence of the child, right? Mm -hmm. um, let them believe in Santa Claus as long as they possibly can. You know, let them, let them be a kid until, I don't care if he's trick-or-treating when he's 13, 14, 15 years old. There's a lot worse things he could be out there doing than out there trick-or-treating dressed up as, a, as his favorite character for the year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Like, let them be kids, you know, preserve that innocence. So I think a lot of what you were, I mean, I'm 100% on with you with, with everything you just said there, you know, so, uh, but that's, that's how we view that part of it is, is preserve the innocence. Uh, I've never heard it phrased that way, but absolutely. I will be using that going forward because that's, that's functionally it. We want them to be children before they're anything else. Yes. Right. They need to be children so they can be children and learn what that experience is and have those experiences. We want them to grow into being a teenager because it's going to happen. Yeah. It, it's we can time marches on whether we like it or not. But there's a reason why time ticks the way it does. Right. Mm -hmm. They get to be they get to be infants. They get to be toddlers. They get to be small children. They get to be children. They get to be preteen and all of the things that come along with that. They need to experience those things in order to grow and appreciate being an adult. Right. right. There are levels of things like, you know, wishing your life in a way is a thing for a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. You you get to 25 and you go, God, I I miss being 15. And you get to 35. And God, I miss being 25. It's like, do you miss being 25 or do you miss not having responsibilities? And do you miss not really being held accountable because you're out in the world and you are still trying to figure stuff out, even though you could be somewhat responsible you knew you had to eat and you knew you need to pay the bills but you may not have done that very successfully at 25 and at 35 you now have more than likely you have people depending on you right, right. there's there are levels to life that you have to get through and there's no point in doing it early and there's no point in doing it late but doing it measured and doing it balanced and doing it guided is can be really helpful and that kind of i i think that that's a, a good segue into here is you've spent a lot of time on the bench um you did it early through the tire store and then you went to a dealership and somewhere in there you had some great experiences but you end up becoming a recruiter for peterbilt so not a, you left automotive into hd and you left being a mechanic to become a recruiter what happened in there to to, to influence the decision to do all of the above? Great question, Josh. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm actually still on the same career path that I had set for myself back when I was in my early 20s, right? So once I got to Lexus um, and I worked, and I and listen, I worked, I worked at Lexus, uh, Lexus and Toyota for 13 years. So this wasn't, this wasn't no short, you know, magic wand that I figured out and, and, my first 60 days, right? Like this was a process, but I learned and I, and I kind of, I, I built a career kind of came up with the idea that I wanted to be on the floor. Um, I wanted to, I wanted dealerships was where it was at. That's, that was where I was going to be working was dealerships. There was no going back. Um, but I also wanted to learn the manager side, the business side. I wanted to, I wanted to work my way over to the corporate side of a dealership, right? So you have, you have the individual dealerships um, and then you have the corporate business that owns those dealerships. Right. I wanted to work my way over onto the corporate side of one of those businesses, um, kind of start learning that aspect of the business, working, working from a higher level. Right. So understanding how the floor works, understanding what happens at the base, but then really getting a chance to learn what happens more on a regional and national level. Um, and then eventually. I wanted to, I did want to move over to the manufacturer and actually learn at an even higher level how the vehicle's built, how it gets to its location, you know, and, and just learn how all of that part works out. I kind of built that career path for me. Now, didn't know I was going to be a recruiter, didn't have any, that wasn't part of my plan, uh, but I, I was a technician, um, loved, loved working on cars. Uh, and I would tell you right now, uh, to all the mechanics out there, Toyotas are great to work on. They're not hard. They're easy to work on. You make a lot of money working on them, uh, if you're if you're wondering. But I did it. I loved it. Um, I got my opportunity to move into a service manager role, and that was not me. So we talked earlier about personalities, right? My personality is not 
I am not a service manager. I'm not a leader like that. That is not, I have a passion to teach and to grow, but the other side of service managing with, you know, having to have the hard conversations, having to answer to the corporate side of the business, like I was just not, I didn't want a part of it. So I went back to being a foreman. Um, I was working at the foreman where I could really, really do the mentoring part. I could teach. And I was a working foreman. So I still worked on cars. I still I still repaired cars and trucks, did all my, my daily stuff there. But then I also worked with the technicians and, and the workload, worked with customers, that type of stuff, right? Um, and through that process, I really kind of started becoming more and more of an advocate for technicians. Like that is really where I kind of first was like, hey, we need to pay this guy more. Like he's really good at what he does and we're not paying him enough. Like we're going to lose him to a, to a competitor that sees value in him. And that is when I started having the conversations with my service manager and sometimes the general manager about, look, we're not, we're not taking care of these guys. Right. Um, we're working them to death. You know, we're, we're saying, Hey, we need you to work more hours, but we're not paying them more. And, and that's really where I started kind of having that passion, right? So that that's when I was in that role, that's where I really started gaining that passion. Um and so cut cut to cut to, you know, getting into the future. I wanted to I wanted to jump over to the corporate side of the business. I happened to be just kind of searching through indeed. Um I came across a job ad for a company called Rush Truck Center. So that's a that is a, a heavy duty dealership group, much like Auto Nation, Asbury, uh, Hendrix. You know, it is just a, a group they own. Um, I don't even know, 200 dealerships, maybe more now. Uh, but I came across one of their job ads uh, for a recruiter role. And I sat back and I was like, you know, this would actually be really cool. I can, I can actually affect a lot of technicians. I can help them negotiate pay. I can teach them how to negotiate for themselves to get better pay, get, you know, get sign on bonuses. I can actually work with these guys. Um, and then I can also work with the service managers to understand why it's important that we do this. You know, why is it important that we, that we take care of them? Why is it important? I feel like I could have a, a bigger impact than as a foreman. And, um, and it was moving to the corporate side of the of the business. I was actually going to be on the corporate side of, of the business, not necessarily the dealership side, right? Um, so I jumped in there and I applied. And um, I'll be honest with you, I interviewed with uh, three guys all at one. It was kind of like a panel interview. And we didn't talk about recruiting at all. There wasn't a word. I don't even know that recruiting was even brought up in our conversation. We talked for an hour um, and then my my future boss finally was like, hey, he's like, we've got another interview after this. We've got to cut this conversation off. We've really enjoyed it. Uh, great meeting you. Solid guy. We'll let you know what we decide. And I walked out the door and my wife was like, how did that go? And I was like, those dudes are awesome. Like I had the best conversation I've, I've ever had. I mean, like all three of them, like they were fantastic guys. I was like, but we didn't talk about the job. Like, I don't <laughs> Like we didn't talk about it at all. So like, I don't, I don't think it went well. About two weeks later, my, my boss called me and was like, Hey, he's like, you know, he goes, want to move forward with you. We're going to send you to background drug screening, yada, 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 go through the whole process. And, uh, before you know it, I got onto, I was working right. And I was a recruiter and I joined the company and, uh, we, we worked everything out and exactly what I had imagined was able to happen. Like I was actually, I was, I was working with technicians every day, all day long. All I did was work with technicians, help them, help them negotiate pay. I helped strengthen our shops. So I would go into our shops. I would talk with the, the service managers, the foremans, find where they're weak at. I could go help them find technicians that were strong there. Um, I could help. I could help technicians that were in a bad situation get into a better situation. And that's where my passion grew. I started Rush with Rush Truck Centers is a great company to work for. Um, I started finding technicians that were struggling at shops that weren't good, uh, nasty places to work, just bad environment, uh, toxic leadership. And I was able to bring those guys out. And I was able to get those guys into uh, under leadership that really cared about them, into a company that really provided for them and get them paid that they really deserve because technicians have been underpaid for years. You know what I mean? 
um, and able to help them get to where they were actually, you know, um, they were actually doing better for themselves. And that drove the fire more, right? It just kept, it kept building, right? So it started as a foreman. And then I, I got in a position where I was touching a lot of people. Well, through my contacts with Rush, I was able to, you know, I met some people with Peterbilt and everything. I had an opportunity and uh, I saw an opportunity that they had open. Uh, and I got to thinking again, and I was like, you know how many more people I could touch at that level, right? I mean, how many technicians could I affect and how could I change the industry at that level um, where you're kind of at the tip top of where everything starts, right? And so I applied to the to the job again. I didn't, didn't know if I was going to get it, didn't, you know, went through their interview process, um, you know, and I think I did okay in the interview. Obviously I got the job, but you know, I think I could have done a lot better too. And, uh, and it just kind of fell into my lap where like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to make you the offer. We're going to get you, we're going to get you rolling. And here I am, uh, spending a lot of time working. Now I spend a lot of time working with students, right? So I went from helping kind of the senior level guys, um, you know, because I recruited a lot of higher level technicians. I'm working with entry level guys now, right? So I'm working with a lot of college students that are at Lincoln Tech, UTIs, all the different community colleges across the country. Now I'm affecting how they start their career. So I get a chance to really have an influence. I get a chance to build relationships that these guys still call me, right? They're out in the field, they're talking and they're like, hey, Josh, man, um, I'm in a situation here at work. You know, I'm I'm looking for some advice and I'm able to kind of help walk them through those situations and, and you know, tell them how to handle it. You know, whether, hey, man, like you messed up, own it. The best thing you can do right now is let's just own it. Let's go. Let's go take responsibility for it. But most importantly, let's fix it and then don't ever let it happen again. You know, let's learn from it. Right. And uh, so that's kind of how I ended up where I'm at with Peterbilt is. Probably more of a God thing, I guess, if, if you want to say that, like it just kind of kind of escalated i ended up where i wanted to be at at the end but i'm in a position now where i feel the biggest thing is that i get i get to influence hundreds of technicians entry-level technicians every year you're affecting a generation not yeah. you're no longer affecting 10 20 30 100 technicians in a year you're affecting a generation of technicians yeah, that is, and that's that and that's where the passion came. Like, and it's grown, and it's grown, and it's still growing. And I'm working to even get back to to working with senior level technicians. We're creating programs at Peterbilt to help us, you know, work with senior level technicians, and you know, and and help those guys, and and you know, just you know, but entry level all the way up. Um, that's where the fire started. The fire started when I was a boy. Awesome, and I and I think that's why it's it's so important at that shop floor leadership level. It's, you know, I, I've called apprentices, apprentices are, are technicians who have been in trade for five years or less. I mm -hmm. don't care whether your country has a quote unquote apprentice program. I don't care whether you call it an apprentice. If you've been in the trade for five years or less, you're an apprentice. I don't care how sure. old you are, period, mm -hmm. end of chat. The challenge is it's that six to 15 year mark where most people are, are still defining, you know, six to 10, you're defining your processes, you're learning your brand, you know, hopefully you're working for a good leader and you're getting the mentorship that you, you need, you're getting your technical training, but at, at the 10, somewhere between 10 and 15 years, the bell starts to ring. It's like, what's next? Mm -hmm. Do I specialize? Do I become like the best transmission tech in the country, regardless of what brand it is? Do I try and start leading a team? Uh, do I look to do what's after being a technician? Like, do I go to try and figure out how to teach and try and get into a community college to teach technicians? Do I try to transition to become a, a service advisor because I really love working on cars, but my body just really doesn't like 12 hour days working on steel every day. But I like the aspect, like, like you, we bring back to the beginning of the conversation, we say, well, some people might be better as a service advisor. Some might be better as a, as a leader. Some might, mm -hmm. people might be better in other aspects of what we do and, and utilize it and repurpose it. But without affecting the beginning, you can't affect the middle. And without affecting the middle, you can't affect the end. And that middle portion is where servant shop foreman really comes into place, mm -hmm. right? It becomes a real opportunity and, and viable option for many to transition out of just turning wrenches 
and taking those skills of problem solving and people people skills to the next level so you can lead teams. That's and right. it's truthfully speaking, you either have somebody who can be a shop foreman for a year to two years and then transition to the next level, or you have somebody who is a shop foreman and finds their home and mm. they can be a shop foreman forever. And both are exceptionally valuable people because I would suggest that the hardest the hardest role in the entire store, regardless of, of industry, is a service advisor because an exceptionally large amount of things are exce uh, are expected of them. They are expected to know all of the technical, whether it's appropriate or not. They're expected to know all of the technical and be able to build relationships and be a top-tier salesperson, right? Those mm -hmm. are three completely separate entities for job skills, and they're expected to do all of them exceptionally well, right? Okay. It's the hard I, – I, I, I will – die on this hill to say it's the hardest role in the, in the store. The second mm -hmm. hardest role is the shop foreman. And the reason being is there's, there isn't a clear cut stamp on the wall definition of what a, a shop foreman is. Everybody knows what a, what a service manager should be and what they should do and the authority and autonomy and so on and so forth. They should have, but that's not the case for shop foreman. And I think, the reason that that's the case is for probably a declining 30 years, it's been less and less emphasized because if you look at it from a business standpoint, you're paying somebody really, really, really well that doesn't produce nearly as much as they did before they were a foreman. That, that is the number one problem in the, in, with the foreman is companies can't justify paying really, really good money to a non-producer, right? Mm -hmm. um, they already have the service manager that they're paying a, a lot of money to. Why do we need another one? Right. And that's, that's where the, the, the role has fallen, you know, over the, like mm -hmm. you said, over the last 30 years decline. And in, in reality, it's a shop foreman's two people. You've got a person who has more than enough experience, technical training and know-how and intelligence to be able to problem solve at the highest level. To get into those those circumstances where you've got a problem vehicle of any kind, where you've got a technician who's struggling for whatever reason, good, bad, or otherwise, they need to be able to go in and they need to swoop in and be like, teach through the moment, but also correct the moment from a technical standpoint. The secondary portion is that they need to be leading the team. They need to be leading the team. And that leading slash teaching moment is a completely separate entity to the person who can also technically repair the vehicle at a high level. You've got two people. So you're paying for two people. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I tell service managers when I talk to them about shop foreman is you're not paying one wage. You're paying two. You're paying an experienced technician capable of fixing any problem that comes in the door. And you're paying a mentor. That's right. When you break it into two roles, it's now a much easier nut to swallow as it were right because a top tier technician who is hourly or salaried who can fix anything is worth 100 grand a year easy easy your mm -hmm. problem solver fixer is worth 100 grand a year period that's right and guess what teachers get paid what 40 50 grand a year yeah. you're expecting them to have all of those responsibilities in one role 130 yeah. to 150 grand a year in a shop capable of affording that, right? Because that's that's the typically the caveat, and that's usually around the fifteen technician mark. Mm -hmm. Fifteen techs can afford fifteen tech shop can usually afford a full time non working foreman without it hurting the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, the foreman's going to double their income, um, right? You got one hundred fifty thousand dollar a year. They should be they should be doubling their value, right? They minimum they should be the, between reduced comeback, reduced uh, increasing your CSI CSE, in, uh, reducing your technician nation uh, blah, 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 words, reducing your technician churn, right? The last thing you want mm -hmm. uh, to, is to have a high churn and have a shop foreman. The whole point of that is to keep people in and train them from the bottom. That way, you're not incurring the recruitment charges, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day. It'll increase your output, right? All of that equals more cars going coming in, more cars going out, right? Which right. is more profit. All right. I think that, that that leads. We've got we've got two quite we got two questions to answer. So first, so you got a lot of time in the trade. Mm -hmm. What would be your one piece of advice for a technician out there to be happier, healthier, more productive? 
happy, healthy, and productive. My piece of advice on that is find the right place, find the right manager, the right mentor. Um, don't don't take the job because the job's there to take. Take the right job. That would that would be that would be my piece of advice. I think if you if you go to a place that has the right manager, right? So, um, and what I mean by that, Josh, is so as a recruiter, when I talk to a candidate, I let the candidate know what the hours are. You know, we discuss a little bit about, you know, the pay range, right? But I talk to them about the benefits of the company. I get all the formality out of the way, right? All the questions and you know, about the job and all that type of stuff. I answer all that stuff. Uh, the reason I set that up like that is when the candidate sits down with the service manager, when that technician's sitting there, the only thing I want them to talking about or, or feeling each other out is, are they compatible? Because I've seen great technicians that aren't as productive as they could be working under the wrong manager. You change the manager and that guy skyrockets and becomes the most productive guy in the shop right um and so with that being said you gotta when you're sitting down talking you should be finding out if there's compatibility there right your interview shouldn't be about how much am i going to get paid money's going to come you're a technician you're going to make money your conversation should be am i compatible with this guy do we work together or do we bump heads right are we hitting each other in the head we're going to be miserable and hate. Find the right place, find the right manager, and then, and then you're going to build your career from there. That would be the piece of advice that I've seen more people fail at is falling apart and not not finding the right place to work, finding the wrong gotcha. manager to work for. Gotcha. That's that's and that's that's my number one rule. The more important than anything as a mechanic anywhere, and this is really anybody. But find your high value leader. That's right. right. If you're not working for a high value leader, it doesn't matter how much money they're offering. You're not going to make money. You're not going to be happy. Right. You're not going to fit. Right. High value leaders change lives. Period. Bar none. Hundred percent. Awesome. Right. awesome. Mm -hmm. So stemming from that, it already sounds like you've kind of answered it. But let let me ask the question formally. So you've been recruiting for a while now, mm -hmm. and you've recruited from. And you're now on in a, in a second place, and you got some some different corporate entities kind of how it how it's flavored your your gumbo as it were mm -hmm. what would you say a technician needs to know or ask to make sure they're working with a top tier recruiter great question Josh so there's a lot of there's a lot of companies out there um recruiting's a big business i did not know how big of a business this was until i got into it recruiting's a huge business and there's there's a lot of money to be made, guys. So one, understand this. They're all they're all trying the recruiters are trying to get paid. That's what they're doing. They're commission based roles. Uh so it's no different than a car salesman, right? They want to talk with you, they want to get you into a company, they want to sell you to the company, and then they're, they're gonna collect a commission off of the recruiting fees. That's pretty standard practice no matter what you do. Here's what here's what I recommend. You gotta find a recruiter that is passionate about helping you get to the right place. Um again, this goes back to my first answer or my 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 other answer right there is if you're being pushed into a place with a bad manager, you're not compatible and they're pushing you in that direction, it's all money driven. You've got to find somebody that has a passion, somebody that listens to you, somebody that's willing to work with you. Uh, and they're out there. I know a lot of recruiters out there uh, that are passionate about the job, not just collecting a paycheck, but making sure that they're influencing and making the industry a better place. And that's what that's what you want to find in a recruiter. Uh, there's a lot of pushy guys. There's a lot of pushy girls out there that are going to try and just throw you at the first place. Find Find somebody who cares about you. They should listen to you, listen to your desires, listen to what you want, and then present the options that fit those 
present the options that fit those uh, uh, requirements, right? Um, mm -hmm. Anything else, they're in it. They're in it for the wrong reason. Gotcha. And, and then you know that that it mimics whether you're working for a high value leader or not, and that's more important than anything. And I think if your recruiter that you're working with or, or thinking about recruiting or thinking about working with as a recruiter, if they don't mimic those same shared uh, experiences, same shared goals, those same hardline boundaries, like you have a boundaries of, of expectations. If they're not clear on that, they're they're looking for the paycheck, not looking for, not looking in your best interests, shall we That's say? Exactly right. No, no, right. Well said. Right. Awesome. I think that's I think that's pretty bloody awesome. I I I, I I'm. I think it's really awesome to be able to to share a story because it's whilst I've done, I think we're going to like, we're, we're going to be like 130, 140 episodes by the time, by the time this gets out and in, into the world, oh, wow. um, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 guests on the show. Well, that's awesome. That's a really small number. And in terms of the number of people in the automotive industry and to think that there are people out there like yourself who started in the industry started turning wrenches, started, you know, pushing a broom, holding a trash can in your hand, walking around, doing tires, brakes, suspension, just to start lots and lots and lots of oil changes, you know, growing up in the industry, having mentors, getting into dealership, learning your craft, learning processes, developing out your leadership skills, putting your toe in the water as a service manager, realizing it's not the place for you, but you still want to affect technicians lives and then finding a, finding something that you can utilize your technician skills, all of the, the problem solving skills, the people skills, the communication skills that you've learned as a technician and turn that into something that you can be passionate about to make sure that you're, you're leaving your indelible mark upon knowing that it's, it's functioning as a, a, a part of your purpose, that you're affecting technicians lives across the country, across the world to, to better the industry. I think that story is one that I I'm, really happy to hear because it's something that I'm similarly passionate about. I, I've turned being a mechanic into something that I'm really passionate about and making sure that I'm doing everything I can to give back to the community. And that's exactly right. to know that in, in 70 guest episodes that there are easily 70 people out there with a similar kind of shared story, even though the path is slightly different that we're all trying to affect the industry positively for technicians is really awesome. So I really appreciate you, you sharing your story. I appreciate you having me again, Josh. This is a, uh, this is my first podcast. Never, never done anything like this. Uh, never thought I would either, but uh, I've had a great time. I appreciate you uh, again. Appreciate you having me on here and letting me share my story. Um, you know, I think with every story, you know, kind of shared, that's just another opportunity to continue changing the future of what our the future of what our industry is going to look like, right? Mm -hmm. and, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's where we want to exactly. get to. And I think that's a that's a great way to end the show, folks. I think that's the end of another Wrench Turners podcast, and this will be the last recruiter series episode. Thank you very much, Josh, Mister Josh Goodwin from Peterbilt. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I appreciate all of you for watching, uh, making this series very successful. I'm, I'm thankful for all of the recruiters that were part of this series. Thank you very much for giving us some of your time and sharing your, your stories, your experiences, and, and your insights across. Um, I think it's just, it goes to the testament of how diverse and yet how small our industry actually is. Because it doesn't matter who I seem to talk to, they always know somebody around the circles somehow, some way. So it's it's really sure. cool to to see how that that works. And you know what? Our quote for the week, I think, is really uh, appropriate for this very conversation. Is that we learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is to not stop questioning Albert Einstein. Remember folks, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.